next guest has gone head to head with Gwyneth Paltrow. She is a fierce advocate for women's health. Her mission, teach women about their own bodies and to separate the myth from the medicine. Some have called her Twitter's resident gynecologist. <laughs> New York Times columnist and author of the Vagina Bible. Please welcome Dr. Jen Gunter. <laughs> So good to have you here. Thank you. Um, so many people talking about you, and you're out there just spreading the gospel of truth, which we really respect, especially when it comes to women's health. Yeah, absolutely. Out there spreading the vagenda. <laughs> the vagenda! <laughs> Your very own vagenda. I want to talk about one of the biggest myths out there, and you know, probably why so many people know your name now. And part of that was going head to head with Gwyneth Paltrow and her website, Goop, and this whole idea of vaginal steaming. Right? Yeah. You have to steam the vagina yeah. for your own good health and to make it smell lovely. Um, and, you know, to it's true. I mean, all of this was out there and people are actually buying the products. Yeah, they were and doing it at home. And the problem with, you know, somebody like Paltrow is she's kind of like the couture of snake oil. So she might talk about it on her website. But then you can now, now buy a vaginal steaming throne on Amazon. Oh, my gosh. You can buy bags of herbs on Etsy to do it. There's all these spas that offer it. So, yeah. you know, celebrities set trends and all of a sudden there's consequences. Does it help at all? Does it do anything? No, no. I mean, it's it's offensive on so many levels. It's yeah. offensive medically because, well, I mean, one, you could burn yourself. Totally. Um, two, if any steam did get in your vagina, it would be bad because your vagina is actually a no oxygen environment. So if any air, you know, air came up with a water vapor, it would be bad. But the also the idea of it is the most patriarchal myth around. So the idea is that it's going to cleanse your uterus from toxins. Okay. Yeah, and that's what the patriarchy says right that that the menstrual cycle is dirty that's weaponized against women so you're really actually taking something that's the core tenet of the patriarchy and wrapping it up with a bow and putting it in a bespoke glass jar and calling it feminism and then making money off it and then making money off of it mm -hmm. so it's just like the worst kind of grifting okay well the vagina Bible um, is it's about empowerment it's about feminism it's about women's bodies it's all of the above and I want to know what inspired you to write this so you know I didn't actually realize it was going to be an act of feminism to write this book until I started writing it and I started seeing like all these layers and layers of how medicine has been patriarchal and how women are systematically ignored and you can't even mention the word clitoris even though it's the only organ in the human body designed for pleasure men don't have that we do I know yeah. Right? Lucky us. So, so I had been in the office one day and I'd been you know debunking myths online for about six years and woman after woman after woman was coming in with misinformation on this one day whether it was found online or from her partner her mom or even another doctor mm -hmm. and after I explained everything and why that wasn't true she said how did I not know that and I heard how did I not know that about five times in a row and I sat in my office and I said how did they not know that? Mm -hmm. Like, how did they not know that? And I thought, you know what? Women need a textbook. They need yeah. a textbook, and I'm going to write it. And Good for are. you. Aren't we glad she wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> so glad you wrote it. That's good. We need a textbook. There's something about the word vagina that in, in itself is almost like a protest, you know, because people don't say the word, they don't embrace the terminology, and it's often paired, you know, when we talk about female body parts, it's often it's seen as something sexual. Right. Um, rather than, uh, you know, a part of the body. So when you were promoting the Vagina Bible, you actually had some issues with, uh, with Twitter. Right. So Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, you know, they, my publisher in the States wanted to buy ads to promote the book. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so they were all rejected because the words that were offensive were vagina, mm -hmm. vaginal, and OBGYN. Really? really? Yeah, like my whole profession, the whole profession dedicated to caring for women's body parts. Yes. That's offensive, right? So, you know, obviously there's a bit of a Streisand effect there and I ended up, you know, getting a lot of press. But the good thing about it is, is that put a lot of pressure on, you know, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Although someone told me that they got an ad approved 
with a male anatomy term. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because that's okay. That's legit. Yeah. That's okay. But, you know, if women are excluded from all the boardrooms, if they're excluded from all the tech companies, yeah. these conversations, you know, they don't even think it's important. It all begs the question, though, where do we find the information from? Because we're bombarded with all of the stuff, and we don't know what's real, and we don't know what's not real. Where do we go? So it is hard, because sometimes even your doctor is misinformed, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I wrote this book specifically because there's a lot of information in medicine that's kind of dogma. Like, some dude wrote something in a textbook in 1950, and the myth has just been perpetuated. Mm -hmm. You know, like, wearing white cotton underwear. Like, yes. I, you know, I remember hearing that in medical school, and I was, like, putting my hand up going, so... If wearing white clothes is good for your skin, why don't why doesn't everybody with skin conditions have to wear white clothes? Why is right. it just my vulva? Yeah. And they're just like looking at me like I, you know, committed some act of treason or something. <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds like a purity myth to me. Right. Right. right? right. Like, it sounds like you're trying to sell me the kind of underwear my mom wants me to wear. Uh -huh. Right? You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think that women can go to trusted resources. I hope my book is that source for, sure. for them. Absolutely. Um, I think also, too, you know, that there are medical professional societies do a great job of actually having good, approachable, and understandable guidelines. Yes. And so in Canada, women can go to the SOGC website. In the States, they could go to the ACOG, ACOG, mm -hmm. and find really good information there. Health Canada as well, the CDC in the States. And so I wouldn't go to Google. I would start there yeah. because then you don't have ads and clickbait. Okay, right, because that's where it gets confusing. Very much so. Can I go through a few myths with you? Please. And you can just debunk or say, no, 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 that's true, okay. because All there right. are a few things that are super surprising. Um, sugar gives you yeast infections. Is that a myth? It's a myth. It's actually been well studied. Your vagina often has more sugar than your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. That keeps the healthy bacteria going. So if you want to have a cookie or a piece of cake, be my guest. I want to have two pieces All of right. cake. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. Very much perpetuated by Hollywood and all the movies and even literature. Most women can orgasm through intercourse. Yeah. So, and who does that? Who does that myth benefit? Right? The penis. <laughs> um, that, you know, this mighty sword. So. Um, <laughs> So yeah, no, only one third of women in heterosexual encounters can orgasm with just penile penetration. Yeah. So if we lead women, leave women to believe that, then two thirds of women are going to believe they're broken, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you orgasm. It doesn't, it just matters that you had fun. It's like a party. Yeah. Who cares if you walked or took the subway? Did you have fun <laughs> at the party? <laughs> That's good. That is a good metaphor. Okay, the G spot is the key to a good orgasm, and this is very much intertwined, I think, with intercourse. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So there's a big myth that the G-spot is some separate gland or structure. And that's because people actually never looked at the original paper by Dr. Grafenberg. But I did because mm -hmm. that's what I do. And the, the, there is an area on sort of the, the lower, what we call anterior part of the, the vagina, right underneath the urethra, that is sensitive. Uh -huh. Because that's where the clitoris becomes close to the urethra. So the clitoris is like a big butterfly mm -hmm. under the skin as opposed to just that little tic-tac on the surface. Mm -hmm. And so you can access part of the clitoris that way. So instead of calling it the G spot, we like to call it the come here spot. Aha! <laughs> it's the beginning of the fun. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. On different days, because that's all erectile tissue, yeah. it can swell in different ways. So that might feel good with one partner in one way, and it might feel better with a different partner in a right. different place on another day. Check it all out. Explore yeah. it. Be a tourist. Yeah. I wish I had a notepad and a pen. This is great. And maybe you should have bring some diagrams next time. I know. I, well, I have a vulva puppet. Maybe next time I can next bring that. Next time bring the puppet. Yeah, we want to see the puppet. I'm going to do one last myth uh, before I give you some good news, and that is the idea of where using organic tampons. A lot of people think you've got to go organic with your tampons. Is this a myth? That's a myth as well. I mean, organic doesn't mean anything anymore, and natural doesn't mean anything. And these studies that tell you you need to use organic, co the, the companies that say that, they haven't produced any data. Yeah. They're just making a claim. And actually, the latest studies on toxic shock syndrome actually show the toxin growth may be less favorable when you have a cotton rayon blend. Interesting. So we don't really know. We don't know what we don't know. 
But yeah. it, there's certainly no data to say that 100% cotton is safer. I would, and there's no data to say you need to use organic. You know, personally, I like to save my money for shoes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Next book, uh, Menopause Manifesto. Yeah, Menopause <gasps> Manifesto. When's that coming out? That will be in a year and a half. Yeah. I cannot wait okay. to read about your adventures through menopause yeah. and everything you found out that is a myth, because that's a big one. There is so much out there. It's um, I'm so angry, but I'm so excited to share it. Yeah. And yeah, it's gonna it's it's gonna knock everybody off their feet in a good way. In a good way. Yeah. Beautiful.